Dear Father in heaven, thank you that we can be here this morning. Thank you for the rest uh, that your Sabbath provides. Not so much physical rest, but the spiritual rest that we can have. Where we can rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. We can come unto you all that are weary and heavy laden and you will give us rest. Thank you for that rest that we can find kneeling before your throne. Father, we're thankful for your grace, for your angels that walk about us. We praise you that the angel of the Lord encamps round about them that fear him and delivers them. We're thankful for the presence of your angels and we're thankful for your Holy Spirit that you promised that would come and be with us. Thank you that they're with us wherever we are. And please guide us as we open your word and teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. Going to look at the uh, next son of Jacob this morning because uh, not only because he's the next one in the order, but uh, you know, as we talk about things, uh, things that could happen, things that will happen, things that uh, could happen to us, something I always come back to is, is, well, sure, that could happen. It could happen today. It could happen tomorrow. It could happen 30 years from now. It could never happen. It could never happen. And we could be amongst the 144,000 that will say, Lo, this is our God, we have waited for Him, and He will save us. You see, so some of those things could never happen. But you know, one thing that we've always got to keep a focus on, and that's to be faithful in the little things of life. Amen. That we need to keep our focus on. And because it's the little things of life that are the most important. You know, something I want to share in the message this morning. You know, when I get up here in the morning uh, at the beginning of the service and we share letters about people across the world that have received literature and they've been blessed and others have been blessed and people have been baptized and churches are being raised up and we just say, praise God. But you know, I want to read something to you this morning that says that there is an even more important work than the work of the minister. Did you know that? There is a more important work than the work of the minister. I want to read and share that with you this morning. Sometimes we look at the big picture and we miss the, the details and the little things that we deem as little. And we look at and say, well, this has no consequence. My life has no consequence to the... It's the little things that make the big picture. And being faithful to those little things is more important than anything else. The sun we're going to look at this morning... If you'd go in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 30. Genesis chapter 30. It's a rather sordid picture when we look at the circumstances surrounding the son of Jacob. We're going to look at this morning. I don't even think we'll read the circumstances surrounding his birth. We'll just look at verse 18. His name was Issachar, which means recompense or hire. Genesis chapter 30, verse 18, it says, And Leah said, God hath given me my hire, because I have given my maiden to my husband, and she called his name Issachar.
So Issachar's name meant recompense or payment or hire, as Leah said there. But Issachar, like all the other sons, or most of the other sons of Jacob, we find we know almost nil about them. We know that Issachar was part of the betrayal and the selling of Joseph into slavery into Egypt. We know that Issachar, like the other brothers, repented and found favor with God and with their father Jacob. But the next time we actually read about Issachar is in Genesis chapter 49. Genesis chapter 49, starting with verse 14. This is Issachar. We found that some of the sons of Jacob were cruel, like Simeon and Levi. Reuben was involved in some bad things of incest. Judah was with a prostitute. Um, of course, they all repented. Praise God that they did. Dan, of course, was uh, denied a part amongst the 144,000 for his wrongs. Have the picture of Issachar in Genesis 49, starting with verse 14. It says, Issachar is a strong ass, couching down between two burdens. And he saw that rest was good and the land that it was pleasant, and bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant unto tribute. So Issachar was not likened to the graceful horse. He was likened to a donkey. Now, of course, in our modern vernacular, when we refer to somebody that way, we're meaning it in a very negative manner. But Jacob was not. Issachar was not graceful, was not fast, like the horse. He was referred to as a donkey. But what positive characteristics do donkeys have? They're strong. They're durable. They're very dependable. They're sure-footed. They're tougher. They're more able to endure long trips than the horse. They don't need as much food and drink as the horse. They're ready to work until they're about to drop. And so these characteristics Jacob identifies in his son from Leah named Issachar. The Bible also says that Issachar was not only a donkey, but he was couching down between two burdens. Issachar was willing to bear burdens, not only his own, but others. Didn't complain that he had to do extra work, Issachar is the kind of person that sees a job that has to be done, doesn't wait for other people to do it. He gets in and does it himself. And so that was Issachar. Sure-footed, durable, hard-working, and willing to bear others' burdens. Verse 15 says that Issachar saw that rest was good, the land that it was pleasant, and bowed his shoulder to bear, and became a servant unto tribute. It's interesting, it says he saw that rest was good. You know, when we have tasks to do, sometimes what we do is we say, oh, well, I'll just leave it for later. Oh, I'll let somebody else do it. But Issachar saw the bigger picture. He saw what needed to be done. He saw the rest that would come at the end of doing what was right and to carry out the tasks that had to be done. And so he put his nose to the grindstone, as it were, to get the job done. 
And so it says that he saw that rest was good. And instead of running away from the problem, instead of running away from the trial, it says that he bowed his shoulder to bear. So he took the task upon himself and became a servant unto tribute. Issachar, like the donkey, he was tough. He wasn't going to run away from problems. He wasn't going to back away. He was going to get in there and take his hard knocks. That was Issachar, Jacob's son. The one word you would not use to describe him, he was not weak. Slow, yes, like the donkey. Plodding along, yes. Methodical, yes. But a coward, no. Issachar got in and did what needed to be done and performed it well. Issachar would not stop in the middle of a job, give it to somebody else to do. He would carry the task to the end. And you know, I think in that way, Issachar was much like Christ because those were the very words that Jesus said through Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 50. In Isaiah chapter 50, verses 6 through 8, we find what Jesus declared through Isaiah. Verse 6 of Isaiah chapter 50 through verse 8, it says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Jesus knew that was going to happen to him. He knew before he ever left the courts of heaven exactly how he would be treated on this earth. He saw it all. But Jesus said, I'm going to give my back to the smiters. I'm going to give my cheeks to them that pluck off the hair. I'm going to give my face to where people can cause me shame and can even spit. Just like Issachar. Issachar's master said, I know what the job is, and I'm going to do it. Verse 7, For the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. He is near that justifieth me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is mine adversary? Let him come near to me. You know, as Jesus ended his earthly ministry, in Luke chapter 9, we read that Jesus set his face. Luke chapter 9, verse 51. Notice what the Bible says. Luke chapter 9 and verse 51. It says, And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Now, did Jesus know what was going to happen in Jerusalem? Of course he did. And he knew that it was the time, as the Bible says. Jesus knew when the time, that the time was come that he should be received up. Did he go away? Did he see the task in front that had to be performed? And did he say... Well, I don't want to do that. No. The Bible says he steadfastly set his face to go up to Jerusalem. So Issachar, when he knew he had a task to perform, just like his master, he did it. Faithfully, he carried it out. In Hebrews chapter 12, we're given the admonition from the Apostle Paul in light of the example of Christ. Notice what Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 declares. It says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight 
and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. You know, it's interesting when I get on the treadmill to start off on three miles, to run three miles or three and a quarter. You know, when you hit the three-tenths of a mile mark, I'm sitting there in my mind and I'm thinking, boy, I'm, I'm hurting this much already and that's all the distance I've gone. And I feel the sweat coming down my face and I look at the, the odometer and it says, Bill, you've run about one mile and I know I've got two more to go. And what do you want to do? You want to say, I'm finished. I've had enough for today. No, you don't do that. You say, I've got to keep going. I've got to run with patience. I've got to just keep putting one foot in, in front of the other one. I can't stop now. You can't stop once you get started and you know you've got a goal. So we've got to run with patience, the race that is set before us. Hebrews 12 verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him, what did Jesus do knowing what would be the ultimate consequence of what he came to the world to do? What did he do, it says? Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. What man, as Isaiah chapter 50 brought out, I gave my back to the smiters. What man would like to have their back torn to, to shreds? What man would like that? There isn't a man alive that would like Do you think Jesus liked that? No. Do you think he liked to have people call him names? Do you think he liked having people tear his beard out? No, he didn't like that. says he despised the shame, but he endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus had a task to perform, had a work to do. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Issachar, like his master, saw that a work had to be done. He was willing to give it everything he had. There's something else. The next picture that we have of Issachar is in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 33. Notice another little window into the picture that we get of Issachar. Deuteronomy chapter 33. He was methodical. He was the plotter. He was slow. But Issachar was sure-footed. He saw a task and he got it done. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verses 18 and 19. This is the next picture of Issachar. It says, Deuteronomy 33, verse 18 and 19, And of Zebulun he said, Rejoice, Zebulun, in thy going out, and Issachar in thy tents. They shall call the people unto the mountain. There they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness. For they shall suck of the abundance of the seas and of treasures hid in the sand. Now in verse 18 of Deuteronomy 33, Issachar and Zebulun are contrasted. Did you notice that? And it said that Zebulun was to rejoice in his goings out and Issachar was to rejoice in 
in his tents. Now what is that talking about? Zebulun was a traveler. Zebulun would get onto ships and go across the Mediterranean and into other parts of the world. Zebulun did his trading around the world. But how about Issachar? Issachar was to be a home person. He was to stay near his tent. Seems so glamorous to go out and travel. I remember when I was a little boy and we would watch sporting events and my brothers and I, we would sit there as we'd watch and we'd think, boy, they get to travel and they get to eat at McDonald's and, and they get to go to Burger King all the time. Aren't they fortunate? And they get to stay in motels and they get to... And we thought it was so glamorous to be able to be a world traveler. And so one of my brothers became a professional sports broadcaster. And now he travels all over America and into other parts of the world. And you know what? Whenever he goes out traveling, you know what he longs for? He longs for home. That's right. He longs to be home. But Issachar was away from the excitement. He was away from the traveling. Issachar would stay at home. Did you notice there that Zebulun and Issachar received the same reward? Wasn't it any different for Zebulun and Issachar? They both received the same reward. I believe Issachar and Zebulun and what God was trying to teach there is, is that whatever tasks God sets before us, it doesn't matter what the task is. What matters is, is that we're faithful to the work God has given to us to do. That's what matters whether we're called to go to some faraway land or whether we're called to go here or go there or whether we're called to stay at home. The important thing is that we're faithful in that task. How often in our world today we're so discontent. Oh, this person's got it better than I do. Oh, this person gets to do this and I don't. And the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4, he said, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11, he said, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. To find contentment in the place where God has called us to be. To submit our will so that we are content with whatever lot God has enjoined upon us. It's a mighty treasure. A mighty treasure. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, the Apostle Paul brings it out again about being content not with what the neighbors have, not with what so-and-so has that we think is so much better than ourselves. But Hebrews 13.5, Paul says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Jesus tried to show that we are to be content. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus taught the very same lesson in Matthew chapter 6 about contentment. Not to worry about what we have and what we don't have. Not to be concerned about whether we have this car or that clothing or this house 
or these goods or that bank account, but that we are to be content with what God has given to us. And we will find that what God has given to us, if we will accept that, then we will find the greatest contentment of all. Matthew chapter 6, verses 28 and 29. Jesus said, Why do you take thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field. How do they grow? They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. The very best that man could do to try to find contentment in this life was Solomon. He had everything you can imagine. Palaces, wealth, influence, everything. He still wasn't content. Jesus said, trust. Trust your heavenly Father. Trust that He knows what's best. Be content with what you have. Steps to Christ, pages 85 and 86 says, the beauty and simplicity of these natural flowers far outrival the splendor of Solomon. The most gorgeous attire produced by the still skill of art cannot bear comparison with the natural grace and radiant beauty of the flowers of God's creation. contentment with where we are. I stated at the top of our message this morning that there was an even greater work than that of a missionary. Let me restate that and say the work of this individual is equal to and the reward is equal to that of a minister or a missionary. You know what it is? The mother. I want to read a few statements to you that brought tears to my eyes this morning from Adventist Home about the glorious work of a mother who raises her children at home. The world needs mothers who are mothers not merely in name but in every sense of the word. We may safely say that the distinctive duties of woman are more sacred, more holy than those of man. Let woman realize the sacredness of her work and in the strength and fear of God take up her life mission. Let her educate her children for usefulness in this world and for a home in the better world. You know, isn't it interesting in our world today? I know as my son, Joel, as he was becoming five, six, seven years old, my dad, who was an educator for 35 years, who taught people who wanted to be teachers, that's what he did at a university, San Jose State University. And then my sister who has been a grade school teacher for 25, at least 25 years, as they watched, and I would not have my son in a formal education, in a formal setting for school, we would do a little bit at home with him as he chose. 
And I remember my dad and my sister would say, but Bill, he's, he's old enough to go to school. And I would say to them, but the schooling he gets at home is to build character. And the building of his character is more important than any A, B, C, or any multiplication table he will ever understand. And so here, it says the work of mom to educate her children for usefulness here and for a home in the better world. Her work in the education of her children is in every respect as elevating and ennobling as any post of duty that her husband may be called to fill even if it is to be the chief magistrate of the nation. The king upon his throne has no higher work than has the mother. The mother is queen of her household. She has in her power the molding of her children's characters that they may be fitted for the higher immortal life. An angel could not ask for a higher mission, for in doing this work she is doing service for God. Let her only realize the high character of her task, and it will inspire her with courage. Let her realize the worth of her work and put on the whole armor of God that she may resist the temptation to conform to the world's standard. Her work is for time and for eternity. Did you notice there what the Spirit of God declared? She said that she may resist the temptation to conform to the world's standard. What is the world's standard? What's the world's standard? What does the world say today? It says, let somebody else raise your children. Let somebody else have them. And God says, Mom, stay at home. Raise your children. The highest work. The highest work. Her work, did you notice what it said? Her work is for time and for eternity. Eternity. Another statement, Adventist home. If married men go into the work, what's the work? That's ministry, isn't it? If they go into the work, leaving their wives to care for the children at home, the wife and mother is doing fully as great and important a work as the husband and father. Although one is in the missionary field, the other is a home missionary whose cares and anxieties and burdens frequently far exceed those of the husband and father. Her work is a solemn and important one. The husband in the open missionary field may receive the honors of men while the home toiler may receive no earthly credit for her labor. But if she works for the best interest of her family, seeking to fashion their characters after the divine model, the recording angel writes her name as one of the greatest missionaries in the world. God does not see things as man's finite vision views them. There is a God above and the light and glory from His throne rests upon the faithful mother as she tries to educate her children. No other work can equal hers in importance. She has not like the artist to paint a form of beauty on canvas, nor like the sculptor to chisel it from marble. She has not like the author to embody a noble thought in words of power, nor like the musician to express a beautiful sentiment and melody. It is hers with the help of God 
to develop in a human soul the likeness of the divine. The mother who appreciates this will regard her opportunities as priceless. Earnestly will she seek in her own character and by her methods of training to present before her children the highest ideal. Earnestly, patiently, courageously, she will endeavor to improve her own abilities. Earnestly will she inquire at every step, what has God spoken? Diligently she will study His Word. She will keep her eyes fixed upon Christ. That her own daily experience in the lowly round of care and duty may be a true reflection of the one true life. Mothers in Israel may not be warriors themselves, but they may raise up warriors who shall gird on the whole armor and fight manfully the battles of the Lord. The whole future life of Moses, the great mission which he fulfilled as the leader of Israel, testifies to the importance of the work of the Christian mother. There is no other work that can equal this. This is all from Adventist Tome, pages 232 to 243. I want to read just a few more. Let every mother feel that her moments are priceless. Her work will be tested in the day of accounts. It will be found that many who have blessed the world with the light of genius and truth and holiness owe the principles that were the mainspring of their influence and success to a praying Christian mother. The sphere of the mother may be humble, but her influence united with the Father's is as abiding as eternity. Next to God, the mother's power for good is the strongest known on earth. Little does the mother realize that her influence in the training of her children reaches with such power through the vicissitudes of this life, stretching forward into the future immortal life to fashion a character after the heavenly model requires faithful, earnest, persevering labor. But it will pay, for God is a rewarder of all well-directed labor in securing the salvation of souls. As I thought about Issachar, Issachar stayed in his tent while Zebulun went out. And Issachar performed the duties, the daily grind them out tasks that weren't glamorous, that weren't uh, blazing on, on signs and weren't going around the world. But Issachar was carrying out the tasks that needed to be done unknown, unheard of, but Issachar was getting the job done. And folk, as I thought about Issachar, I thought, what, is there an individual in our world today that is unrecognized, that is obscured, and yet the task they perform is so vitally crucial in our world. And I thought, yes, there is. It's the role of the Christian 
mother. The Zebulans and the Issachars receive the same reward. Same reward. It's very interesting. It was the Issachars in the battle at Megiddo in Judges chapter 4 and 5 with Deborah and Barak. Guess who was down in the valley with Barak plodding along to go to battle against the kings of Canaan. Do you know which one of the tribes was down there? Issachar. That's right. Dan was out on ships having a good time. Reuben was still searching his heart. But, what's that? One was on the sand. One was on the sand? Yep, that's right. That's right. Issachar was plodding along, carrying out the duties of God faithfully. The little duties that everybody else didn't want to perform, there was Issachar. Right there with Deborah and Barak in the great battle. Issachar was not flashy, but Issachar was faithful. Issachar was not speedy, he was slow, he was not careless. But he was careful. Quietly he accomplished the daily tasks that God set before him. And because of that, God had greater tasks for Issachar to perform. And I believe when Issachar stands before the great throne of God, Jesus will simply say, Issachar, because you were faithful in that which seems small, I will now give you even a greater reward. Because he that is faithful in that which is least is also faithful in much. Let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, thank you for the Issachars. Help us to accept the responsibilities that you've given to us. Help us to be content with whatever lot we find ourselves in. And Father in heaven, I just want to pray today for the Christian mothers that are still left in this world that pray for their children, that are at home with their children if they have children of that age. I just pray that you would strengthen them and help them to see the tremendous and glorious task that they're performing in raising their children. Please bless them with that courage. In Jesus' name, amen.